Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your grace, your love, for your submission to your Father's plan when it cost you greatly, dearly. We thank you for the victory that you have secured over our sin, over the power of death, and even of hell. We stand in awe of you, Lord, and we worship you as our Lord and as our Savior. We ask this morning that you would cause your word to speak to us, that it would be encouraging, uplifting, convicting. Lord, that we might see many people come to know you because of the faithful preaching of your word and the witness of your church. So we pray that you would bless now the hearing of your word. Help us to be people who don't just listen to it, but who do it by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, so I might get super excited this morning in my preaching, and if you got a little excited too, that would be fine. I'd be good with that. Uh, But I want you... I want you to sort of know right up front what it is I'm trying to accomplish. Here's what I want you to walk out of the door knowing, knowing in your mind. That submission to God's will, no matter what the cost, is the Jesus way. That's what Jesus did. And that's what we are supposed to do, to submit ourselves to God's will no matter the cost. That is the Jesus way. And then... If you walk out of here not just knowing something, but with something to do, it would be able to lean into capital L love. The kind of love that Jesus displayed for us, that while we were still caught in our sin, he loved us so much that he died for us. And uh, there's this revolution that Jesus started in his resurrection a revolution that is not political in nature, it is spiritual in nature. And all things stand downstream of the spiritual. And so it truly will revolutionize the way you think, the way you act, the way you are a parent, the way that you are a son or daughter, the way you are a brother or sister. It changes the way we live. So with that in mind... I want to say to you a word, and perhaps it will spring something to mind. Revolution. Revolution. Like political revolution. Like this corrupt system around us. We need to burn it to the ground, and from the ashes we will build a new way of governance that will be fair and pure and Everything's going to be better after the revolution. Many, many people over the years, many groups of peoples have preached revolution. Our own country was founded on the spirit of revolution. Down with the British and up with the flag of independence. We shall be the United States of America. We declare our independence. And we, we resolve new government. A revolution is nothing new. It is a yearning inside of the human heart from days of old. The promise of changing the fundamental landscape that we live in so that things will be better. And all revolutions, if they are going to be successful, need a character at the center, a charismatic leader, a George Washington, a Karl Marx, somebody who embodies the spirit of the revolution, someone who knows how this new government is going to work, someone who can accuse the old corrupt system and say, when the new system comes, it won't be like this. The rich won't be getting richer, the poor, poorer. But no, we'll do something different. We will legislate fairness, equality, justice. 
And in the time of Jesus, there was no people who yearned for revelation more than our Jewish forefathers who were under the heel of Rome, where the Sanhedrin had become corrupt and it was impossible to fulfill the law that God had given to them. And they wanted a revolution. And they were looking for a revolutionary leader. And they called these revolutionary leaders messiahs, anointed ones, Christs. And along came this character, Jesus of Nazareth. And there was nobody like him. He came in power and authority. He cared about the poor. He could heal the sick. He could cast out demons. And when it came to the old corrupt system, he did not shy away from standing toe-to-toe with the leaders and saying, Woe to you! Woe to you! A new system is coming. And I am he that brings it. And the crowds were just all about it. They'd never seen anyone like this. He was a prophet. He was like a priest. He was, he was a miracle worker. And in fact, people from the Sanhedrin were coming and submitting to his authority. Roman centurions were coming and saying, we know you've got authority. And we're willing to submit to your authority because we see that your rule is just and kind. And Jesus marched on Jerusalem just last week. And he came to the temple, the center place of government control, the control of the law, the place of sacrifice, the place where corruption had had come in, the place where the Romans had guards all about to put down all of the riots that would spring up time and time again. And he made a whip and entered into the temple and drove out all the corrupt people. And the lame and the mute and the blind came crawling into the temple and he healed them all. And he declared a new era. And people were so excited. Then he told his disciples... Don't think that I'm the kind of Messiah that all the crowds want. I'm after something a little bit more. A deeper corruption. A deeper problem. Rome is not the ultimate problem. The Sanhedrin is not the ultimate problem. We are the ultimate problem. Sin is the ultimate problem. And I think that if you look back in the history books, at the history of every revolution that has ever happened, you will see that Jesus is quite correct. That even the systems that that preach total equality, total redistribution, the government becomes corrupt and there becomes a ruling elite class and everybody else gets oppressed and then those systems through time oppress a lot of people, genocides, lots of those. As those, as those corrupt people cling to their power and the people start talking to one another, man, we need another revolution. Time and time and time and time again. Jesus knew that the problem was not human government. It was the human heart. And the people thought, well, Jesus' heart is pure. If he is the center and he came up to, to stay, start this new government, he would be able to keep the government in check and keep everything running smoothly. But Jesus was after a bigger fish than Rome or the Sanhedrin. He was going to overthrow the very power of sin, the very power of death, the very reality of hell. He was going to take it out. He was going to start a real revolution. And he was going to do it by fulfilling the law. The law, as we have been studying every Sunday morning for like the last million weeks, the book of Deuteronomy promises two things. It is a covenant, an agreement between God and the people. And God agrees that if the people will obey him, this is his covenant, you draw near to me, there is blessing, a land flowing with milk and honey, a just society, everybody doing well, the poor taken care of. 
everything right. The rain's coming on time. No blight, no mildew. No locusts. Or, if the people move away from God and into idolatry, they would experience cursing. Both of, things, both of these things are realities that God brings to the people. Both the blessing and the cursing. The blessing could only be had by drawing near to God. And the cursing could only be had by moving away from God. And so God promised the blessing would be a land flowing with milk and honey. The cursing a land flowing with wrath and wormwood. And here Jesus came to fulfill, to bring the law to its absolute fullness. He fulfilled the law. And he did so by understanding the heart of God, by teaching the heart of God, by doing God's will on earth, by continually being near to God. Jesus did the law, which no person had ever been able to do in the history of mankind. In fact, we are cursed to never be able to fulfill the law because of the power of sin at work inside of us. And this doesn't take a genius to know. It doesn't matter what kind of law you are under. No person is able to keep it completely. It doesn't matter if it's a speed limit. Nobody who has driven in their entire life has not broken the speed limit. Because it's impossible to drive 45 miles an hour exactly on the dot. And then when it changes, like, do you slow down before the sign? Or, you know what I mean? And be right on it? There's just so many... There's just so many variables. It doesn't matter what the law is, any law. But specifically, the biblical law, as summed up in the Ten Commandments, there is none who could keep the law, except Jesus did. He not only completed all of the do-nots, but he fulfilled the, the very heart of it. He also completed all of the do's. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. How do you keep that law? But Jesus did. It was impossible for us. But because Jesus was God in the flesh, he fulfilled the law. But let me ask you this. How could Jesus go after the power of sin and death in hell if it took the power of God to fulfill the law? How could people ever fulfill the law? How could people ever get to the blessing? He had to fulfill more than just keeping the law, doing the law. He had to become the things that the law prescribed in order to be reconciled back to fullness with God. Jesus Christ became the sacrifice that the law demands. He became the way back to God. He had to fulfill the blessing, and he did, indeed. But how could a man who did not violate the law, how could he fulfill the cursing? Do you see the conundrum? That our very salvation depended on, on a, a man fulfilling the law of God, and he did. But how does he fulfill the curse of God if he, if he never wanders away from God, if he's always near? There's actually a provision in the law for this. In the book of Deuteronomy, the community, the community of people was able to place the curse on someone by hanging them on a tree and executing them. If they would hang on a tree before God and the community would condemn them and execute them, then God would extend the curse to that person. The only way that Christ could become the curse for us was to be condemned by us. And boy, did we. I want to read for you this morning from Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Paul is writing to the Galatians and trying to encourage them not to leave the faith, not to try to exchange faith in Jesus for living by the book of Deuteronomy in its code rather than in its intent. 
And the Apostle Paul says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written in the book of Deuteronomy, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. If you don't fulfill the law completely, if you don't fulfill the covenant, then you are under the curse. Verse 11, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The people extended the curse to him and placed it on him by executing him, by hanging him on a tree. But God brought the fullness of the curse onto Jesus Christ by ratifying that curse and allowing Jesus to experience the fullness of it. Jesus himself cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He didn't deserve it. But Jesus was after a bigger fish than just the power of Rome. He was condemned to hell. He was condemned to eat the wrath of God, the wormwood of God, the cursing of God. To bring the cursing to its absolute fullness. So God poured out His entire wrath, all of His cursing that the law demands onto the person of Jesus. And He died and descended into hell and actually filled up the fullness of the curse. And then Jesus rose. Been waiting a long time to... Then Jesus rose. What does that mean? What does that mean? That the fullness of the curse, it was brought all the way to its fullness. It was poured out entirely. There's none left. And then Jesus rose. I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus has redeemed us from the curse. Amen and hallelujah. He brings back with him the blessing. Jesus has redeemed us from the curse and has brought with him the blessing. Jesus redeemed us from the curse. He brought with him the blessing. I want you to turn uh, over to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to read to you verses 17 through 24. Again, different book, but Paul's basically writing the same thing. And he's trying to encourage the followers of Jesus to live in the blessing, not in the cursing. Paul writes, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, 
in true righteousness and holiness. When Jesus filled up the fullness of the curse and brought it down into hell, and he rose again, free of it, he brought with him the blessing of God. He did what we could not, but he did it for us. We extended the curse of God onto him, and God ratified it. And Jesus rose and extended the blessing of God to us, and God ratified it. How do we know that it is true? How do we know that we now have the blessing of God, the full blessing of God through our faith in Jesus? Paul is very clear here. Christ slew the power of temptation and sin. That actually, believers, people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, can say to the sin that is destroying them, no, I will not participate any longer. I say no to my old self. And we can choose to shed this old self and put on the new. And the new is Jesus. The risen Lord Jesus. He told his disciples, he said, now that I'm back, now that I'm alive, I had to fulfill all of this stuff. And there's something that I have to give to you. It is my very spirit. The spirit that filled the cursing, extended the blessing, and lives in power and authority in submission to God is something that we can put on ourselves. Hallelujah. We can choose to shed the old self and put on the new. Jesus invites us to receive His Spirit. That's how we can know it's true. We can actually live as Jesus Christ lived. We can actually be free from the power of sin. We can actually submit to the will of God when it costs us our everything. We can be kind and loving to people who don't deserve it. We can extend forgiveness to people even before they're asking for it. We can have the Spirit of Christ not just on us, but in us. And this is an incredible power. This is the power that Jesus had when he entered into the temple and declared the revolution. This is how we participate in such revolution. Rather than the way of the world, which tells you to participate in the revolution, you go out and you kill all of the people that are against you. And you assert yourself in dominance over them. No, you do it the Jesus way. And you be kind until their heart is so convicted that they know they have to change. You love even while they're condemning you and spitting on you. Even while they're torturing you and your children. You have the Spirit of Christ, which Stephen, the first martyr after Jesus, demonstrated while he was being stoned to death with rocks, not with drugs, with rocks. They were throwing rocks at him. He cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Oh, they knew what they were doing, but they didn't. They were participating in revolution the way that the world does. But Jesus has a better way. We participate in the revolution by receiving His Spirit. Let me read for you, if you just flip the page, to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Paul is going to give a suggestion about, now that you have committed yourself to saying no to the power of sin, the power of darkness, the power of death, and even hell, condemnation. You've just said no to it. I have faith in Jesus, and so I just say no. And you put on the new self, and you are now living under the influence of the Spirit of Christ. Ephesians chapter 5 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Just as Jesus became a sacrifice, an offering to God that was well-pleasing to God's heart, so we too, when we put on Christ, are totally, totally free. 
totally pleasing. Very lastly, if you go back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul tells the Galatians what kind of life they live when they are loving and giving and living with the Spirit of Christ in them and on them. He says, For freedom Christ has set us free. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Because on this glorious morning so many years ago, Jesus Christ rose up out of the grave and extended to us the blessing. We are free. We're free from the power of temptation of sin in our lives. We are free from participating in sin, in death, in hell. We are free. In fact, Jesus promises his believers. And I was performing a funeral yesterday where I reminded the family there, Jesus Christ promised that those who believe in him never experience death. That even though their physical body may expire, they do not experience death. But they are already alive in him. Because when we put on Christ, when we put on his spirit, when we choose blessing and not cursing, we have already been to the grave with Jesus. We are already resurrected. So our physical bodies can fall down, fall away, get sick, die, whatever, be tortured, be ripped apart. Our spirit is whole. Our soul is saved. It is alive by the very spirit of Christ. We are free. What are we supposed to do with this freedom? This revolution that Jesus Christ has already accomplished and is now inviting us into. He says, you are free now. You are free from condemnation. You are free from your sin. You are free from acting like you used to act. You can put on Christ and be free. What shall we do? We shall stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, and do sub not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So many voices out there in the world this very day that says, if you follow me, I can make it all good. If you give me your money, your boat, your whatever, I can level the playing field and, and, and bring in the new kingdom. It'll be heaven on earth if you just trust in me. And I'm not just speaking tongue-in-cheek about politicians. I'm talking about substance abuse. I'm talking about anger. I'm talking about revenge. I'm talking about getting somewhere in life. I'm talking about the power of money. We are free from it. We can stand firm and not submit again to a yoke of slavery. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free, and so we stand firm. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free, and so we stand firm. Like true patriots of the gospel. We are free, and so we stand firm. We will not submit again to the yoke of slavery, to the yoke of sin, to the yoke of popularity, to the yoke of money, to the yoke of being somebody, to the yoke of feeling good. We have the Spirit of Christ bestowed on us. We can live in it through faith that Jesus Christ has accomplished it. What does one have to do in order to receive this incredible gift from Jesus Christ? To receive His Spirit which has already experienced the fullness of the cursing and has risen again in glory. What do we have to do? Repent and believe. You just, you have to not want sin anymore and say, God, I want you. I don't want to wander anymore. I want to be near to you. I want to be near to capital L love. I want to be free. And I have faith that Jesus Christ accomplished it for me. And I choose to receive the Holy Spirit and from here on out to follow God.
That's all that's required. That is all that's required for freedom. The Bible gives us a warning that during our lives, during our time here on earth, we have the opportunity to repent. We have the opportunity to accept the fullness of the curse laid on Christ and the fullness of the blessing laid on us. There is a short time for repentance. And so today, today, if you hear Him speaking to you, do not harden your hearts, but remain soft. Say, yes, Lord. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And then we can stand firm. I pray that you today, um, who are new in your faith, who need some time to work this out and, and, and begin to learn how to stand firm, that you would see Jesus not just as the suffering servant, but as the one who submitted to God's will when it cost him everything. And that he says, he promises, you can do it too. Don't give up. Don't stop. Keep going. For those who have never accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I would invite you to receive Him. I want to close with a passage from the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Just four verses, uh, verses 4 through 8. Grace to you and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood and made us a kingdom, priest to His God and Father, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of Him. Even so, Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's give our hearts to Him this morning and stand firm. Father, we thank You that You made a covenant with us for blessing and cursing, invited us to draw near, and gave us Your law to entice us, to cause us to be in awe of who You are, to love You, to see how righteous You are, how caring You are, how much love You have for us. And Lord, you promised to bring the curse on those who choose to walk away, to not love, to be filled with the power of darkness and the promotion of self. And then, as we were flailing about, you sent us your only begotten Son, to fulfill the law on our behalf, that by faith, that by faith, we might be brought to you blameless, pure, and holy, wrapped in your spirit and in your righteousness, pure as the driven snow. And you have caused us to be here on this earth for a while, to be your witnesses of those around us, to show them the very heart of God, to love you with all of our heart and our soul and our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, we know that you are are coming again, and we look forward to it. And we pray, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit out 
to convict the heart of those who are still far off, that they would see how lovely and wonderful you are, that they would see the way to you through faith in your Son, Jesus. Lord, help us to be those kind of, of lights in the dark world, those kind of witnesses. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Would you please rise and receive a benediction? Now to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.